Welcome to this lecture on new towns. It is about a concept for, well, creating livelihoods, interesting livelihoods, and basically to find ways for a good future for all on a green planet. And let's start. Uh, my name is Ralf Otterpohl. I'm the director of the Institute of Wastewater Management and Water Protection at Hamburg University of Technology. So when we look at pathways for development, we surely see that there is uh, one pathway um, that is sort of happening at the moment that doesn't look very good. So this is the scenario of further degradation of soils, further destruction of vegetation cover of forests, and this is something that leads to a desert planet, uh, drought, crazy climate, flooding and frequent famines. On the other hand, we have all the tools to create a green earth. And this green earth can be sustaining the lives of many, 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 many people. And uh, even 30 billion people could live on life very well in wealth. If that doesn't make if that, that doesn't make sense, it's a different story. But it is possible from the resources. Feeding animals alone is the equivalent to around 70 billion people. So no worries there. And on a planet where people live in wealth and dignity, overpopulation will not be an issue. I guess. So now the desert planet, 60 years of farming left if sale, soil degradation continues. So that's the harsh scenario of agrochemical agriculture and the destruction is not only happening by all the uh, toxic stuff that is uh, distributed on the fields, uh, the groundwater being polluted, uh, but also it is partly uh, by plowing the soil. And so the, the plowing is uh, destroying the soil structure and we need to move to different ways of agriculture. But for that, very many people are needed. This lecture is showing ways out of this disaster. It's part of a vision for a good future for all on a green planet. So part of the suggestion is to make many more small farms, small scale operations, market gardens, and to make clusters of those to make them viable. Small farms feed, feed the world, and that's something what uh, the World Agricultural Report has clearly shown. So around 70% of all food is produced by family farms, according to the actual World Agricultural Report as of 2020. So the idea of new town is to make more options for people who want to do uh, well farming on a small scale, but maybe not as their exclusive occupation, working from early morning till late night. So that's not a nice vision for a good future in my point of view. So the idea is to have clusters of farms that are operated in uh, part time. And so each and every person working a small farm can cooperate with all the neighbors that are doing uh, farming at the same time, gardening, horticulture. And um, if that is something that is done in a proper way, it can be highly efficient, highly productive and um, people would have the freedom to do two or three different occupations. 
and that could become a very interesting lifestyle indeed. This is what I call new town or uh, garden town, gardener's town, however you want to call it. But the idea is also uh, to cooperate with large-scale farming around, so to have holistic plant grazing, agroforestry systems, or even conventional farming. The overall picture is to, well, rescue cities from being destroyed, um, to reverse urbanization, reverse in environmental migration, what is a big disaster, terrible for the people who are forced to leave their land that has nourished them, them and their families forever. And also, this is to assure water supply, food supply, regenerative energy, maybe by wood gas. And at the same time, cities should become greener. Uh, they should be recycling more resources, water um, and materials. And uh, cities should also produce soil fodder because what we get with the food should be returned to the land in some way. Otherwise, the land will not be fertile anymore. So that's the overall idea to have an interaction between cities and, well, new towns around so that you can have, uh, well, support of the city from around. So this is the outline and we will uh, be in systems thinking. And new town is uh, a systems approach looking at many different aspects of how society could work. And it's about saving the cities and it will be about the foundation for local production. And then in the last part of the lecture, we will look into elements of the new town. So let's start. Save the cities. Overurbanization can destroy cities. So too much in many places. Imbalances can become dangerous. Cities are 100% dependent on the rural. And with the current depopulation of the rural, there is a lack of care of, for the soils. There is a lack of people doing proper agriculture with building soils, keeping vegetation cover going and knowing how to do that. It's a complex thing. It, it cannot be, be, be left to agrochemical agriculture that tends to destroy the soil. No, many people are needed to build soil and to spread the word and to help uh, building up on what is there. Everything is there, but people need to do it. Otherwise, we will be in the 60 harvests left scenario, and that's not a very positive one, uh, as I said. So it's about water regeneration um, and recreating a uh, balanced local climate. We do have depopulation in many parts of the world and it is happening also in Germany at an enormous uh, pace. So um, we do have so many people that are moving from the rural to the cities and uh, this is something that is sort of unhealthy, unbalanced. And the same happens in many parts of the world. And where people live in the, well, rural areas, it's often urban sprawl. So here, look at southern Germany, Bavaria, 
this is an example where people are commuting long distance, even uh, two or three hours commuting a day. Even I know cases, one partner living, uh, uh, working in Stuttgart, the other one in Munich, and they live somewhere here. And so they are commuting a large part of the day uh, with a big ecological footprint and um, they are not really there. These are ha often big houses uh, with barren gardens. They have often stone gardens because they don't have the time um, to be there really. And they are sort of not helpful for the development in the rural areas very much. So that's not the idea, not commuting, but creating livelihoods in the rural and finally to combine advantages of cities with the advantages of rural areas and become productive. So big cities, uh, they are 100% dependent on supplies from outside. And there is a, a book uh, by Mark Ellsberg called Blackout and the subtitle is Tomorrow Will Be Too Late. One night the lights go out across Europe. The electrical grids collapse on an epic scale and unleash a devastating chaos in the total blackout. Unfortunately, this is not all that unlikely. Uh, Mark Ellsberg has done this in a, in a proper scientific way and it's only one scenario that could happen and we have a catastrophic, um, well, weak magnetic field now. So if there is a big solar flare, there may be catastrophic uh, blackouts uh, all over the world. And even if it lasts longer all around the world, and then we are far away from being Middle Ages, we will be like Stone Age and start all over again. Look at all the computers uh, and uh, smartphones after the electricity is gone. What can, what can we really do? What are we capable of? Just buying a smartphone or can we really do something in real life? Agrochemical industry is a fight against nature. It does not make any sense at all, except in saving labor or as the downside of that, make jobs disappear. Most people around the world don't have any meaningful occupation. That's not making any sense. It's basically a business model, and I wouldn't say clever really, because it's a ruthless, crazy thing. Agrochemical industry destroys soils and pollutes the groundwater, and if it's stopped, farmers can earn more money. And well, there are the examples and we will go into this um, a little bit more in an overview way. Many insects and birds disappear. Human health is compromised big time. It's really incredible how many people are chronically ill younger and younger ages and uh, the food that is delivered by agrochemical industry is lousy so it's uh, well not having uh, the trace elements needed because they are not replenished it contains uh, toxic agrochemicals that are proven to be harmful and it's something that is unacceptable if we go for agrochemicals, and I'm not dogmatically against them, they should be proven to mineralize in the given situation so that those agrochemicals that are applied will finally break down to CO2 and water and not accumulate in the groundwater, accumulate in human bodies. Uh, the agrochemicals today, the pesticides, can be found almost in every person around the world. You and I have them. And that's crazy, isn't it? Well, the 
The destruction of the planet, unfortunately, seems to be highly profitable. And so, if we as people don't get our act together, uh, this will just continue. And this is nothing what is uh, good for humankind. It's not even good for those crazy people who are so greedy and missing the meaning of life. Now, one simple example, and this is a cost balance for um, the EU on, um, well, the well, end fertilizer alone. So economic profits from end fertilizers are 20 to 80 billion euro per year. I'm not saying profits are something bad, but if the resulting costs for health impacts, pollution of groundwater and climate damage are exceeding the profits by far, so the damage is around 75 to 500 billion euros per year, then this is crazy and this should be ending. So, there is a long-term comparison of a farm that was split 50-50, organic and agro-industrial, agro um, and that's the, um, the great Rodale Institute in the US. And they have been running uh, half of the farm organic and half in the chemical way, and they do both very well. So it's not just showing, uh, well, you can do this or that uh, by uh, pretending one of that is, uh, well, bad. But they really do both in a proper way, doing trainings and having uh, something that is really uh, worked out very well and well maintained. So the yields uh, would be around the same on both farms. Total profits, dollars per hectare and year, and hectares being a bit more than uh, two acres. One hectare is two point, around 2.5 acres. And the total profits now, $1,300 on the organic farm and only 470 on the chemical farm. So how is that possible? Because here the money goes to uh, agrochemical companies and it's a losing game. It's a, well, money is extracted, so the rural areas are becoming poorer and poorer, while here on the organic farm more money is earned in the region and there is more labor behind that, but that's labor that is paid. And another important aspect is that energy usage is definitely quite a bit lower. The thing is, organic fam farming has to be done in a good way. Otherwise, it will not be very efficient. So the common propaganda that organic farms are having less yield is disproven on a large scale over decades. So the thing is that organic farming should be improved. Many or most organic farms today are still plowing. That goes nowhere. So if you destroy your soil fungi all the time and you expect having a good ecosystem, that's an illusion, so that will not work. I'm not saying that I know how to do it, but I know that there is enough farmers that can do it under the most extremely different circumstances. So it is doable. It is not that difficult on a level of principles, principles of soil health, principles of ecology, but it's very difficult 
on a local scale to implement such systems. And for that, we need highly trained people who are really good at doing that, implementing that. And that's something what doesn't go together. If rural areas are losing people, everybody wants to go to cities, um, then the future will not be very bright. Organic farming can be profitable forever and food and jobs, oops, uh, Agrochemical farms have maybe 60 harvests left. So agrochemical farming is the lowest possible efficiency because they produce, well, reasonable uh, yields for just a few decades and then the land is dead. That's not high yields. That's, well, ridiculously low and it's it's a complete and utter nonsense to do this. So, um, one more word on what is going on, and that was uh, what I learned only very recently. And th this is that um, we do have um, a big demand of uh, micronutrients for efficient agronomic production. And this is a, a recent article that looks into the micronutrients. And here, for example, we do have the zinc. And now the demands and then how long will it be lasting? And now imagine zinc will last 20 one years and this is well incredible just imagine zinc as one of the key trace elements to keep us healthy so it's a major part of our immune system it's lacking in food already now around 50 percent of the world arable soils are lacking it and if this will be increasing, it will be very hard indeed to keep being healthy. Chronic illness is rampant already, and it may be the norm rather than something what uh, is hitting a third or a half of the population. Another example, molybdenum. 54 years. Without molybdenum, a lot of uh, well, pathways, biochemical pathways uh, in well, living systems are not working. And one of the prominent ones is molybdenum is needed to bind nitrogen from the atmosphere. So leg legumes only work if there is molybdenum around. So, um, A healthy planet and healthy humans might become very rare within only 21 years. Legumes might fail within only 54 years. And it doesn't look much better for the other elements, iron, um, iron manganese, copper, boron very important all relatively short expected lifespans hardly anybody's addressing this even myself I, i'm dealing with these issues since like minimum 15 years i haven't heard that the situation is that dire so uh, we have two pathways uh, to make life on earth uh, more a life of scarcity, disrupting climate and to head for starvation. So that's one scenario and we are headed for that pretty fast forward. So 
what I'm promoting here with New Town is make life on Earth abundant for nature and humans. Save the cities by regenerative agriculture and productive gardens. So people uh, should find a good livelihood in rural areas, combining upsides of cities with the upsides of the rural. And that is something where those people working in rural areas can supply the city. They can assure that the water supply will keep running. If the soils are fertile, the rainwater will infiltrate, while a barren soil will not take up the water and the water supply will be stopping. We can have supply of excellent food with all trace elements if we dare to care. And that's where Today we have around 50% of people living in cities and it's projected for the future to go up to 70%. Just imagine 70% of humankind living in cities, bigger and bigger cities that are partly dysfunctional already today. So it would make a lot more sense to have around 30% uh, of people in cities and 70% uh, in the rural. All right, so, so much about the big vision that we should have in mind, but then we should know how to make it work. And that's what I want to go into now. So this is foundation for local production. There is uh, an overview of options for high quality, high yield local production. And I go through this pretty quickly uh, because we have Nexus 2 lecture where the details are there. And I will start uh, with the large-scale farming. So we have seen that restoration is possible. We have seen that such areas can be restored over like something like 5, 10, 15 years. And this is something what is very, very encouraging. And it could be done in so many places of the world. 40% of the world is considered dry land. So many areas are uh, degraded and that could be done on a very large scale giving giving good livelihoods to those people that are participating and to restore this requires people so restoration requires people and this work can get them family farms and such family farms can ultimately feed the world. And the idea is to back up restoration by creating new town, to not only making it uh, feasible for family farming, but to make it, make it attractive for those people that are not having the connections to farming anymore that want a nicer life in nature instead of being in a, in a flat in a big city facing hundreds of other flats and well, not having a meaningful occupation at, for, for, for very many people. So that's something that could help um, restoration should be followed up by new town scenarios. <clears throat> and that way, restoration can be uh, kept on track and be uh, well productive in the long run. Well, large-scale agriculture in well in a way of improving soils and 
making uh, the region very, very productive uh, is something uh, that uh, Gabe Brown has demonstrated. And it's also implementing uh, to have animals and uh, wheat production um, on the same areas. So the separation of the two is causing so much damage to the environment and is, well, disgraceful for humans to keep animals in big cages, uh, never seeing the light of day. And uh, imagine the animals that are living out here, having good life and restoring the soil at the same time. Uh, there are luckily also people in Europe. Um, in Germany, we do have uh, Zepp Hagler, and uh, there is also video material in German, uh, Interessengemeinschaft Gesunder Boden. And uh, now there is um, literature on how it can be done. And uh, the one book that is a must read is really uh, the great book of Gabe Brown. It took a long time until he really came out. Uh, great videos by him like this uh, TEDx video. Uh, and what he has done, he and others have done, has gone to scale. So you may have heard of uh, David Montgomery, and he has written the bestseller Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, where he's clearly showing that civilizations have destroyed themselves by destroying the soils all over again in human history. And we are about to repeat this, but luckily we are realizing now what is going on and we are ending this. And this requires many, many more people to join in. And um, regenerative agriculture has already uh, developed to quite an extent. And David Montgomery of Berkeley University has shown that regenerative agriculture has grown massively, especially in large parts of North America. He has seen that those areas where people have switched to um, regenerative agriculture, stopped plowing, applying cover crops, having vegetation cover all year round, there is wealth. You can distinguish this by driving through these regions and those with regenerative farming. The houses are uh, renewed, uh, the, the, the uh, economy, local economy is prospering. And those areas where people are still going down the pathway of 60 harvests left, there is poverty, property for sale. And uh, that is clearly showing where good future can be uh, produced. And that's a good thing. So I mentioned the holistic plant grazing, and uh, it's also uh, called rotational, sorry, grazing. Keep animals on a small plot and lead them on very frequently can build soil. So those guys here, they may not be that destructive if they are managed in a good way. Also look at the materials of uh, Joel Salatin, who is a big promoter of local economy in the US and has uh, great videos out. His farm is called Poly, uh, Polyface Farms. Polyface Farms, so because he keeps many animals together. Because, for example, it does make a lot of sense to uh, keep uh, cattle and uh, uh, chicken on the same patches three days apart. The chickens come and uh, eat uh, the larvae that are developing and thus eliminating uh, the parasitic disease of the animals. So synergistic systems 
and a lot more is possible, of course. So now a uh, little bit on agroforestry and um, the well, an, uh, a relatively old um, work on agroforestry or the use of trees um, for producing high quality uh, food is from 1929 and that's the book by Russell Smith. It's famous in permaculture luckily but not very much known otherwise and he's saying trees can restore soil produce food and fodder. A wide variety of uh, production is Probably uh, is, is possible, and now, uh, and that is lacking in uh, the book of Russell Smith. We have the world champion moringa tree, and it's producing nitrogen. And uh, the example that Russell Smith has given is the example of Corsica, um, the Mediterranean island of, of France, where uh, sweet chestnut had been uh, encouraged by a duke long time ago. He, he gave children a little bit of money to, to plant uh, sweet chestnut. And over the decades that led to having millions of sweet chestnut trees and when a big famine was hitting France, this region was wealthy because they had all the food. They didn't have any shortage and uh, so that shows the resilience against catastrophe. And even today, the sweet chestnut in that area of Corsica is preventing erosion. And luckily, after being well neglected for a while, the sweet chestnut production has picked up again and people are taking up this highly profitable trade again. So, agroforestry, Professor Martin Wolf has given a lot of good examples. And uh, then there is also Nature Fund. And they are saying um, that we should have maximum 50% crop plants, minimum 25% soil restoring plants. And that would be also the legumes and minimum 25% of local species. I think that's very much straightforward. Uh, Nature Fund is very, very uh, successful with uh, dynamic agroforestry. Uh, look up their website. And um, they have done projects in South America. And now a question to all of you. What is the same for both of these systems? Both are farms. So which one do you prefer? And which one works better? So situation one, the farm of the left, left hand side, looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? We have a soil temperature at noon of 60 degrees Celsius, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing grows anymore at that time. Soil life will be compromised. Biodiversity as a consequence is low. Yields are low and it's hard labor. Now we have the uh, agroforestry farm soil temperatures at noontime, 20 degrees or around 70 Fahrenheit. And well, that's climate balancing. That's part of creating a balanced climate on the planet. And it's balancing the climate at its best because it's producing good livelihoods, good food, uh, lush nature and uh, high yields, high biodiversity. And labor, it is a lot for startup, but it's low once such systems are established. 
So, high quality food from trees. Deep roots take up more minerals. I talked about the trace elements. And there is uh, the sweet chestnut. And uh, sweet chestnut is fantastic food. I really love it. So this is a picture from uh, my kitchen. And there is an organic farm that is producing the sweet chestnut flour. Very tasty and um, very good food. And then there is also uh, the sweet oak or oaks in general. Um, so that would be these guys. There are much bigger ones than these. These are just from my surroundings. I don't have the, the good ones around here. And very prominently, prominently walnut. And walnut has a very high content of omega-3 omega fatty acids that are crucial for good health. Absolutely crucial can't be overestimated. Oakmeal, uh, uh, an initiative um, of uh, Marcy Lee Meyer in uh, Greece. She's from the US, developed uh, the production of high quality food from uh, acorns. And um, she has developed a very uh, productive project uh, that is called uh, Oakmeal. And they are producing uh, oak meal cookies to show people how nice uh, oaks can be. Look up her uh, video. She has a TEDx out and explains more on that. And you find more material on the website. You can join the project as a volunteer, but be early. It's booked out very, very fast. So, um, it's on a beautiful Greek island. Look at the picture at the top of this uh, graph. And it has developed uh, some scale already. So it's uh, where they have achieved uh, good results already now. So it's also ideal to cooperate um, between Newtown Market Gardens Hmm, something wrong here uh, Between Newtown Market Gardens and um, uh, large-scale agriculture and now I will uh, get in small-scale farming uh, once again, just as an overview, new town and uh, clusters of market gardens. Um, there is the fantastic book, Miraculous Abundance, and uh, this is by Perrine and Charles Hervé Gruyer from Normandie in France. Not a tropical climate, even... Uh, well, Middle Europe, where farming is not that easy because there is a relatively long winter season. And a um, long-term scientific study has shown uh, in the final report um, that they can make around 40 to 50,000 euros on only 1,000 square meters of ground. Um, uh, around 10,000 square feet um, and uh, by humus enrichment, by very good ways of uh, opening up synergies, planting fast growings between the uh, low, slow growing ones and so on. And this seems to work out very, very well indeed. Uh, one person is needed, one job created or Newtown style, uh, three people are sharing. So for not having farming as a burden, if you do it seven days a week, uh, it becomes a burden easily. Uh, but if it's a few hours per day, 
it's fantastic lifestyle and I'm absolutely in that I have my uh, permaculture uh, place and I love to do gardening but I also love to go back to the desk after I have worked in the forest for a while and my back starts hurting and <laughs> then it's good combination to do manual labor and to do something on a desk or do teaching work and uh, whatever else. Um, the Market Gardener by uh, Jean-Martin Fortier uh, from Quebec, Canada. And he has written uh, the best-selling book, The Market Gardener. He's become very prominent. What is bearing on him, on him? I met him and he was really, really very overworked not from the farming work which they arranged in a proper way but from all the presentations he's giving uh, and even around the world by now uh, the book is great and also available in our THH libraries so for the Nexus students get it and study it quite uh, Many more examples. Curtis Stone from uh, also Canada is a good example. Look that up and they seem to make uh, also around 50,000 euros on a thousand square meters. And that if that looks very much, keep in mind it's a lot of work at the same time. It's well paid, but it's not uh for the greedy ones who want to fill their pockets and leave everybody else starving um, these are, are some other examples and this is a picture from uh, the eco village uh, schloss tempelhof in germany i've given a presentation there um, a few months back or it's it's almost a year now and they have an excellent market garden and actually they are doing the things like uh, Jean-Martin Fortier and also um, the La Ferme du Bec Elon, uh, miracle, Miraculous Abundance. And uh, in this picture they show how complex uh, the intercropping can be. So you're having plants that like each other that can be neighboring, uh, but then you have other plants that are not liking each other. And so you would sort of find combinations and distances where plants do like each other. And this is called intercropping. Then also you can learn a lot by uh, Charles Dowding, uh, No Dig Farming. and. Uh, he has many, many great videos out. Uh, well, the link is there. Um, Dan Kittredge is my favorite uh, gardener, and he has uh, achieved something what very few people have managed to do. Uh, he, he has built on the research of uh, Professor Wilhelm Eilbrecht, who was teaching at uh, University of Missouri a long time ago. And he and his uh, followers were pushed aside by agrochemical industries. So they do not do fair play all the time. They are using foul play. And with that, they created uh, a disaster in the world. So fair play is a prerequisite for a good future and we should not accept uh, companies to use their monop monopoly power use their power over politicians and uh, destroy the world and themselves all right so that's that's it for now so that's the first part of uh, the new town lecture and the second part is following. Thank you.